Aeschylus wrote the Oris Diary originally as a trilogy, right? It was, it was three parts with the fourth. The first part was the Agamemnon, then there was the Libation Bears, and it was Eumenides. At the end of that, they had this really short, like, Seder play, which was a play that was to be performed, you know, once everything was over with as a sort of, you know, comedic relief skit, which is probably a really good idea after, like, you know, three or four freaking hours of family trauma drama, right? So to really dig the Oristia, you need to get hip to the stories of both the Trojan War and this curse placed upon the house of Atreus. And certainly, a Greek audience member of Aeschylus' time would have mainlined these yarns since their cells began to split. Now, the house of Atreus, the problems with this house go way to hell back to Atreus' granddad, Tantalus, who cut up his son, Pelops, and served him to the gods at a shindig. Now this pissed them the hell off. And they cursed him and his descendants with an ass load of grief. I'm talking a Jennifer Lopez ass load of grief. Lots of junk in the trunk. We're talking everything from indigestion to incest. So since cooking habits are often hereditary, when it came time for Tantalus' grandson Atreus to serve up his own brand of human concumen, he cooked up his brother Thyestes' children and served them to Thyestes in a fine consomme. Now skip it ahead. Atreus eventually sides two strapping lads, Agamemnon and Menelaus. Now y'all remember Menelaus, the cat who gets his lady yanked by that Trojan pretty boy named Paris? Well, Menelaus decides he ain't gonna take this kind of diss sitting down. So he goes to his older brother Agamemnon and says, yo, let's roll on them underhanded, wife snatching, guest host relationship violating father mother. <laughs> and of course, Agamemnon, never being one to miss a chance to rape or pillage, said, cool, let's go fetch your wayward squeeze, my brother. <laughs> But as the Greeks try to get their war on, the goddess Artemis messes with the sea winds to keep all the Greek ships from sailing. Now to overcome this, Artemis says, yo, Agamemnon, if you want these warships to leave Greece, you got to go and offer your daughter Iphigenia as a sacrifice to me. Now it ain't clear that this has anything to do with the curse placed upon the house of Atreus, but still, Agamemnon started thinking, damn, a brother cannot catch a fucking break over here. Anyway, Agamemnon, who probably felt real funky about having to gut his kid, deliberates. Do I kill my daughter? Do I kill my daughter not? Do I kill my daughter? Do I kill my daughter not? And I guess as a thousand ships were parked in the harbor outside of Aulus with thousands of hungry and angry Greek warriors rattling sabers, and because he publicly beat his chest and talked so much smack about putting an old-fashioned Greek ass whipping on Troy, that for him to back out because of, you know, some shit like, you know, fatherly responsibilities, would have monkey wrenched all his plans. So, hey, he decides to kill his daughter. Now, needless to say, Clytemnestra, his wife, and Iphigenia's mom had serious issues with that cat's choice. And from that point on, started plotting some payback on that son. Now, while AG is off in Troy doing sail bides and snatching other men's women, Clytemnestra hooks up with his cousin, Aegisthus, who, because AG's old man Atreus preconceived Aegisthus' siblings, has much beef, on <laughs> her with the house of Atreus. <laughs> but since Atreus is no longer around, Aegisthus just figured he'll take it out on Agamemnon's ass. Now after the war is over, Agamemnon comes back, to, comes back home from Troy with this Trojan war prize, Cassandra, Priam's daughter, a real fine royal looker with the gift of prophecy. Now at this point, Clytemnestra had to be thinking, oh, Hell no. I just know this cat ain't gonna kill my daughter, play warrior for 10 years, then bring some spooky eyed bitch up in my house and think I'm supposed to do nothing about it. He don't know who he fucking with, but he about to find out. <laughs> now, though AG's act overturns an already hyper agitated domestic apple cart, Clytemnestra, duplicitous minx that she be, starts putting on public displays of affection. And I mean, the sister lays the PDA on so thick that everybody at the, at the welcoming party was going, damn, what's up with that? This is hypertext Greek tragedy lesson number one. <laughs> when a main character starts acting strangely, somebody's about to die. Anyway, Clytemnestra <laughs> somehow got AG into the bathtub, and while you know he's feeling all unsuspectingly soft and bubbly and shit, she throws a net over his naked ass, pulled out a blade she had been saving for just the right occasion, and proceeded to shake his ass like Norman Bates in a prison riot. 
Now, AG, who clearly couldn't keep a damn thing to himself, starts screaming, hell, I done been killed. I done been killed. <laughs> now, people in the palace get to guessing what the hell is going on, but ain't nobody stupid enough to run in the direction of all that screaming. Now, that's when Clytemnestra comes out covered in AG's blood, and she ain't even trying to hide that shit, G. It's like she in one of them old Perry Mason dramas where the perpetrator breaks down on the stand and starts screaming, yes, yes, I killed him, and I'll do it again for what he did to me. But what she actually says is a lot more poetic. Dig this shit. She goes, when his blood splattered all over me, I felt like plants must feel when the rain showers down on them in the springtime. Now to really dig this is to dig that to a fifth century BC Greek, anything talking about rain coming down and fertilizing the earth or plants was considered a reference to the sexual. So, for Clytemnestra to say this would have been understood as meaning that to kill her husband felt the same as getting her nookie cookies. <laughs> and I mean, damn, if I had been plotting to kill some ass wife that really had it coming to him, there might be some quasi-orgasmic thing frolicking in my nether regions once the act was consummated. Well, AG's murder didn't sit too well with Clytemnestra and AG's two remaining youngins, Electra and Orestes. Orestes is who this play is named after. Electra, who had been reduced to a slave in the house she grew up in, went to visit her old man's grave, pull libations, and leave flowers there. Now, while she did this, she gets to musing aloud. Damn, I wish my brother Orestes were here to handle this shit and take care of these cats. And when you know it, he just happens to show the hell up. That's the way shit goes in a Greek tragedy. Now, because the ancient Greeks are so damn patriarchal, neither sibling ever had an inkling of thought to take out their father for offering their sister Iphigenia. But they both immediately start hatching plans to get some payback for their father's 187. Now, after Orestes took out his cousin Augustus, he turns to his mom. Now, she don't, he don't want to do this, but Apollo keeps telling him, yo, dog, do it. I got your back. <laughs> And just as Orestes is about to rock about his mom, Clytemnestra bears her breast to him and says, my boy, I nursed you with these. Have a little mercy on me. Now, for those of you who read the Iliad, you'll recall that when Hector was going to go out and fight Achilles, right? Hecuba, Hector's mom, did the same thing. She bared her breast and says, boy, I nursed you with these. Have a little mercy on me. So, let's just say this. How can I put it? <laughs> 